President Zuma to expel Sean Abrams. Which is this, that the, for the purposes of deciding upon urgency, the court assumes that the applicant's case is a good one on the merits and that it has a right to the relief. And the importance of that starting proposition is so that in addressing these preliminary points, we don't stray into the merits, which is a constant temptation. But for the purposes of approaching the urgency, one will have to take the case as presented to be good and that the relief is both competent and required. With that starting premise in mind, we then would submit to the court that the following are the facts that the court is confronted with. This is a case in which uh, the second, third and fourth respondents have engaged in misconduct of a gross kind. They have behaved unconscionably in respect of the manner in which they have instituted the prosecution and then withdrawn it. They have engaged in conduct which has brought grave suspicion upon the independence of the NPA. And they are a leadership cohort that we have made a case for the proposition that they cannot remain in office pending an inquiry that is necessitated by the misconduct in which they have engaged. So this court will approach with respect to the question of urgency with all those allegations taken as read. And the question then is, well, is this a case which requires urgent intervention? Or would it suffice for the court to have this matter heard and the review determined in the ordinary course? Now, the, the averments that we have made in respect of urgency are captured at page 58 of the papers. And particularly at paragraphs 160 and 161, where it is said that it is evident that substantial redress cannot be obtained in due course, and as the matter is patent, as the matter is patently urgent. I'm sorry, my lord. It's page 58 of the papers, paragraph 160 and 161. We say that relief cannot be obtained in due course. The conclusion is fortified by the fact that the issues raised in this matter strike at the heart of our constitutional democracy and the ramifications for our constitutional democracy of allowing the second to fourth respondents to maintain power unchecked, unaccountable, and under a cloud of justified suspicion. If a hearing were only to take place in the ordinary court, there's a real risk that this will result in continuing irreparable harm to the reputation of the NPA. We make these submissions. This is about the urgency in this case is concerned with the institutional integrity of the NPA, which is a constitutional office of the first importance in this country. And we say the matter is urgent because if the second to fourth respondents are not subject to an inquiry, and if they are not suspended, then they will continue to discharge their functions when a long shadow hangs over their competence to discharge their functions and in circumstances where we say their integrity is in question and the perceptions that they are not properly capable of leading this crucial constitutional institution have been a matter of great public concern. So in our submission, this is not a question as our learned friends have sought to suggest in some of their submissions before this court, of showing some irreparable harm. They mistake the nature of the case that is before this court. The question of irreparable harm of the sort that they refer to is the species of harm that is sometimes important for the purposes of urgent proceedings where interim relief is sought in interdict proceedings. And so they raise the question as to, well, where is the particularized harm that is likely to result 
if an inquiry is not launched immediately and if these persons continue in office. That is not the relevant inquiry. The relevant inquiry is twofold. One, in the light of the egregious conduct that we say the second to the uh, fourth respondents have engaged in, is it safe to allow this critical institution to be led by this triumvirate as the leadership of the NPA? If, I'm sorry. But I just think we need to, to be on the same understanding as we proceed. Your reference to paragraph 160 and 161 of the table represents the foundational basis of the relief. Now, the relief you seek is pertinent uh, to paragraph 1 of the that you want to review and set aside what you call failures and abuse. Yes, ma'am. Is it not proper to actually factor in what has happened? Can we still say there's a failure or an abuse yes. based on what has happened yes. in response to what your correspondents evoked did in the presidency? Yes. Lord, uh, if I may deal with that under the heading of rightness, because it is relevant to the question of urgency. Um, but uh, the, 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 the question of rightness is whether the response of the president is a lawful and adequate one, at least pro tem. Yeah. And does that dissipate the urgency, which is, I think, the force of your lordship's question, uh, Jimmy. And if I might develop that argument in the context of the rightness debate, because it has a number of strands uh, to it, uh, I, I, I will then explain in our submissions why it is that the rightness question is not an availing one for the purposes of saying that we should let the presidential process take its course, and only upon the conclusion of that process should we then uh, approach the court. So, my lord, we, we accept that the rightness question and the urgency question are interlinked propositions, but uh, I would need to answer fully the rightness question to fully answer your lordship, and I, I can go on to that topic if that would be of immediate assistance. No, no problem. You, you can even respond as you want, yes. but the, the real uh, issue of raise that question is, can you still say you want to review and set aside failures when we know that something has happened? Yes. On an edit basis. Yes. yes. Uh, and, and perhaps let me just, if I may, just finish the, the, the starting premise for uh, our, our contention on urgency, yeah. and then I'll come to the issue as to whether there is a failure in the light of the presidential process that has, uh, that has issued, and what does that say then uh, about urgency. If I could just make two very short further submissions on the general proposition around urgency, which is, is, is this. Ours is a case of urgency around the immediate need for action to present to prevent institutional harm to the NPA, a constitutionally critical body. And the question that arises is, can any time go by where persons who we say are incompetent, have misconducted themselves in a grievous fashion and have shown a warrantable lack of integrity, continue to head up this institution for any period of time. That's our starting premise, and that is the premise on which we say this court should entertain these proceedings on an urgent basis. That institutional urgency, if I can frame it in that fashion, is not a function of asking a question that our learned friends appear to be attracted to, which says, well, even if they are incompetent, and even if they have shown a lack of integrity, can we second guess whether they would continue to be incompetent or continue to show a lack of integrity in the many and important decisions that this leadership cohort will necessarily have to make as the months go by? And we say that is not the test, 
and indeed it would be an extraordinary test that no one could ever prove. But the fact is, once the leadership cohort of the NPA has shown what we say are, uh, is, is a lack of integrity, a, uh, has misconducted itself in the grievous fashion that we complain of, then in those circumstances it is very much like a situation where you cannot put a pilot back in the cockpit if they have shown themselves to be incompetent at flying. And they've yeah, Well, in our submission, they've done exactly that. They have crashed this institution from a leadership perspective, and yet they want to go back into the cockpit for an indeterminate period of time. So it's not responsive to this artificial test of counterfactually asking, but who's to say they would continue to lack integrity or continue to misconduct themselves or continue to be incompetent once shown to lack all of those fundamental features of fitness for this high office, then they compromise the institution if they stay there for one minute longer, and that's our institutional claim to urgency. The, the, um, that, 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 that is the starting premise for, for the urgency, and that is why we say it is not responsive to the first kind of argument that is made by our learned friend. The second argument that is made is to, the second Let's go back to the second Yes. Bearing in mind that we think that what we is the institutional basis, why will there be no substantial agreements in the normal court? Yes. In this type of yes. Uh, Lord, that was precisely the second leg that I wanted to come to. The, the other feature of the argument that is made is to say this. What our learned friends say is, but let this presidential process take its course. In due course, he, the president will have the submissions of the affected parties. The president will come to some conclusion on both the question of the inquiry and the question of suspension. And if we are dissatisfied with the decision that is thereby rendered and then rendered by the president, well then we can review the matter. And that review will take its course through the courts in the ordinary way. And ultimately, if our case is a good one and the president has failed in his duties, well then we will get re redressed by way of review in due course. That is the contention that is, uh, is offered. And our submission is twofold on this score. The notion that given the case that we have put up for the incompetence and unfitness of these persons to continue occupying this office, the notion that we will get for the public's interest and the interests of these organizations as applicants redress in due course would countenance a situation where, for all practical purposes, these persons, the second to the fourth respondents, will continue to lead this institution for a time period that could be in excess, in excess of a year. So if one takes the starting premise in the 20th century Fox case, which is to say, we have a good case on the merits, then the court would be having to countenance a situation where incompetence and persons who are grossly lacking in the qualities required to lead this critical institution will necessarily remain in office for a period of a year, because no doubt a review in the ordinary course will take a considerable period of time and be appealed and probably eventually end up in the constitutional court. A year, 18 months, all of this is something not likely to be countenanced by a court. So we, our submission on the second score is simply to say relief of this kind is illusory because it allows the leadership cohort of the NPA to stay in place unaddressed for a period of time that is unconscionable given the powerful positions that are occupied, the damage to the institution which would simply be perpetuated and the sh long shadow of suspicion that would hang over the NPA if this leadership cohort was to continue. The Lords and the Lady, one issue. Do you understand me correctly to be saying <coughs> that this application was triggered by the conduct of the 
second respondent in the withdrawing charges? Lord, that, that is certainly part of what has triggered this. There is, of course, a course of conduct. If I, could, if I could just very briefly summarize three aspects that affect the second respondent in particular. There are three critical aspects to, to his conduct. The first is that on the 11th 